chit chat. And so we can do that. If we want to go down that path, we can easily, easily do that. Okay? Sound, sound okay? So I started with one group here. Um, I got everything except for the tall shrubs. So generally I tried to get an evergreen, some bloomers, and a perennial. So three things kind of together from tall to small. And so generally you'll take your landscape, and you'll have something tall in the back. Frequently it's to screen out the neighbors or to make private the hot tub or to accent, let's say Granite Oaks, uh, up against Granite Mountain or Thumb Butte in the center of town or the Frisco Peaks will frame shrubs, larger ones, to force the eye to look at what we want to look at. You can actually accentuate the beautiful views. And we are in the mountains. All of us have a beautiful view at some point, either a sunset, something is gorgeous, which is why we're here. So you want to kind of have your landscape frame that for you. The same with your house. The biggest mistake I find is people will take a big shrub like this. This is a classic old fashioned juniper. You cannot kill this. It grows up this big by this big around. If you want to define a property line, uh, you want to uh, basically block out the neighbor's fence or debris pile if they're a contractor or soften that ugly looking shed that should have been knocked down about 20 years ago. This is, a, this is your shrub. So it's evergreen, you can't kill it, it's consistent, it's methodical. The negative with this is if you put this right next to the house or right next to the driveway, it will take over. I mean, small children dogs have been lost in this shrub. <laughs> I mean, it gets thick, big. I mean, it's like six by six by, by that. It does make a great hedge. So you can trim on it, keep it blocked. And if you just want a really hardy thing. Now, a lot of folks think junipers. I'm not doing junipers. I'm allergic to junipers. No, no, junipers. There's a place for them. If you're allergic to junipers, and I am terribly, it's not this guy that gives you the allergies. It's the large alligator and shaggy bark junipers. And it's not just any of those, it's only the males that give you issues. Of course, the females <laughs> do not. The males are the ones that spew off all the pollen. The females are the ones that form the berries. Now you know something you can tell the sex of a, of a juniper tree. Berries, female. Males are the ones that turn yellow almost in spring. I mean, late winter, early spring, they just have this yellow hue and then they just explode with pollen in spring. That's when we all get allergies typically. March and April is when we have some real issues. This little guy, this little tiny shrub is not gonna be an issue for you. Um, I, did, I tend to invest in a lot of properties. So rentals, that kind of stuff. This is the kind of shrub that I would use for that because a tenant cannot kill it. I mean, it's just tough, it's a second home. This is the kind of shrub you want because you just can't kill it. It's consistent, it's always looking good. With that, because it gets so, so large, you want to step down into things like that. Isn't that pretty? Summer through fall, you can count on abelia. That's what that is, to bloom. It's tougher than it appears. It does very, very well locally in the, in the local landscape. So you put it on a drip system, maybe water it twice a week. When it's established, when you get the roots out, maybe once a week, once every 10 days or so. So it's pretty tough. This plant gets up about chest high and it is deciduous. That is, it loses its leaves through winter. The beauty with blooming plants is you get the bloom either in spring, let's say lilacs and forsythia, or in summer like crepe myrtles and abelia. And then you also get the fall colors. You get two seasons where it really, really looks good. When it's blooming, then it'll just have a green, bushy, Feel, which is okay and then it gets this beautiful gold color this particular one or reds or oranges and I, I put some of those together in our walkabout so you'll see those abelia okay gets up like similar size to this but it blooms and not evergreen so you want 20% of your landscape to be evergreen 20% to be spring blooming 20% to be summer blooming and then 20% to be fall color. The other last remaining bit, just have fun. Your gardeners, plant whatever you want. If you love spring blooming things, you like going out and deadheading flower, get the forsythias and the 
lilacs and the quince. If you're here mainly in the summer, you're down in the valley for, for the winter seasons, two home folks, we have a lot of that. Plant the summer things. Get your crepe myrtles, rose of Sharon's, just roses are good choices. Skew it towards when you're outside enjoying your landscape. Okay. This is probably our most famous of all the deciduous shrubs. Anyone know what this is? Salvia or autumn sage. Okay. Gets up about knee high and ball shaped. And it just starts blooming. Mine started blooming in April and it's still in full bloom. Okay, it's autumn sage because its best blooms are in autumn. It will, it is deciduous, it'll lose its foliage. Kind of, you'll forget where it even is. It's just a bunch of twigs showing up. Uh, I'll, I'll keep mine intact as best I can through winter. And then in March, I'll tend to shape it up and I'll get it back to about, I don't know, just below knee high, just shape it. <laughs> I'll fertilize it, it comes back and in April, it's in bloom again. You can just count on it. Hummingbirds dearly, dearly love autumn sage. And javelina, find it detestable. It's a good plant. For good. Every yard should have a one. This is the other one. Maybe this is the most famous. I don't know. They're, they're companion plants. They look good together. This is Russian sage. This is autumn sage. Anytime you hear the word salvia or sage in the mountains of Arizona, you know you got a good plant, which means it's fragrant. It's got a sagey sense when you rub this. It'll have kind of a sagey, sagey scent, which means animals don't eat it. You put it right out there in the javelina path, and they might dig it up and throw it to the side, but they won't eat it. You have to put it back in the ground. So you got to get it established. But they're very curious critters. At deer, rabbits don't eat this. So you're perfectly fine. This happens to be a little spires. It's a dwarf variety. It only gets up this tall instead of this tall. So it's easier to control, easier to maintain, less pruning, less all the things I like. So I don't like pruning. That's just work. This one happens to be a new variety that comes out. So all those go together. And lastly, gopher plant. Isn't that pretty? It screams Southwest, Arizona. Just says, very unusual perennial. It, that is, it, it lives from year to year, uh, but it's evergreen. So it, it stays looking like this. Now, if you're gonna kill this particular plant, it gets up maybe, not even knee high, maybe maybe that tall, maybe 18 inch. Gets this beautiful yellow flower in the spring. Um, if you're gonna kill this, it will be from over watering. Take a close look at that, folks. Yeah, online, yeah. Okay, so gopher plant, I think everyone should have one of these. It's hard to find them because they're such a specialty plant, kind of a slow grower, but tough, tough plant. This would even look good in a pot. The courtyard has that southwestern kind of designer, kind of designer feel to it. It'd look good that way. Okay, with that, that's one cluster. Now I've got some better selections around the nursery. What I thought we would do is maybe walk to the lower greenhouse start with that selection and kind of walk back up this way and I'd end in the shade and then the native collections. So I've got a hardcore native. I mean, just nothing but agaves and yuccas and silverberries, that kind of stuff. And then I've got your traditional Midwest, euonymus, that kind of stuff, and a collection thereof. Okay, so why don't we go this way, follow me, you all, and then we'll be smart by the time we get done. Now I didn't put trees with this. I mainly put a tall evergreen, a shorter evergreen, a taller deciduous, a shorter deciduous, and then when I could, I put a couple perennials that would kind of finish it off. So here, I chose this one just because it's such a great Arizona native. It's kind of like that juniper we were talking about. This is Arizona cypress. It looks innocent. You want to put this right down the driveway or something, right next to it. This gets 20 foot tall by 12 foot wide and thick for me to you. I mean thick. So be careful where you put this. But it's a great backdrop. It's a great screen. Great property line. Kind of big shrub. So I call it an upright evergreen or upright shrub kind of thing. But much smaller than, let's say, a spruce or a pine tree. So easier to control. The way I tell the difference between a juniper and a cypress. Cypress put on these little tiny cones. It's not a berry, it's actually a pine cone. 
And that's the only way I can really, it kind of has that juniper look, but it's not, it's like this, okay? Great tall thing. <coughs> now I gotta get my pet peeve out of the way right off the bat, okay? Don't plant this plant. Oh, I guess. I still have a kid to get through college, so plant them. I'm putting them through college just by selling this one plant. This is red-tipped Photinia. I think it's way overdone. I like to sell it because it's so disease-prone. Deer eat it, problematic. And so you're gonna be in the nursery constantly for fertilizers, bug sprays. So it keeps me going through the hard times. Personally, I don't have one of these in my landscapes. And to my friends, don't plant it. It's just nothing but a problem. But it's fast growing. Generally, they're cheap because they grow so fast. The mistake I see, they put them right by the mailbox and it engulfs the, the, the property line. This is 12 by 12 by 12. It's a monster. So there's a place for it, but not necessarily the right place. Red tip Botinia. What I plant myself, I much prefer this one. If I want a tall evergreen, oh, I broke it. If I want a tall evergreen, this is a native called Eliagnus. I think the name Ellie and then Agnes or Silverberry. This one is related to our native one that grows wild. It's just we put this gold variegation on it, which makes it very good looking, I think. The way you know that it's a native, it's got a thick leathery leaf. It's got color on one side and it's silver on the back side, which makes it very efficient on water. This, you could actually let it go by itself in the landscape. Virtually no maintenance, no, I mean, no water, a fertilizer every once in a while, but this is a great plant, I think, and it gets up about head high. This is much easier to maintain than that beast of a red tip Potinia. So I plant this one. It is evergreen, okay? Has the, the sweetest flower you've ever smelled. You won't see it. It's insignificant, kind of forms in the base of the, the leaf, but the sweetest flower, I think it outshines even lilac as far as bloom, or, uh, fragrance goes. Of course, the most famous summer bloomer, if you want some hype, this is butterfly bush. And I think every yard should have at least one butterfly bush. Now, there's different varieties. There's butterfly bush, you get as large as a greenhouse, and there's some that stay cute and small and little. Plant the one that's right for you. If you're up and down the property line, you got space, a big one is super. Uh, if it's right next to the patio or in a container, it's going to get way too big. It's a dwarf, guys. So there's different varieties and a few different colors. Basically, they're variations of pink and reds and purples, lavenders. Um, butterfly bush. And yes, butterflies truly are attracted to them. You'll have guaranteed butterflies all over it. Monarchs, swallowtails, painted ladies, all of them. Um, I brought this one out as a lower growing evergreen. Well, this is distillium, it's a little bit unusual. Beautiful, hardy, tough evergreen. It gets up about, I don't know, hip high to chest high, somewhere in there. It just has this nice evergreen look. It does get a slight bit of red on the new growth, so it's kind of like a dwarf version of this, red to Potinia, but easier to maintain. So I, if you're gonna plant an evergreen, this is probably a little bit better choice, and it goes with all of these guys. So just a companion plant. <clears throat> For low growing, you just want things staying low. I brought this cranberry. Isn't that pretty? Mm -hmm. It shines in the fall. I mean, it's just cranberry cotoneaster or cotton easter is how it's spelled, but cotoneaster is how it's pronounced. It's got this beautiful green. It only gets up less than knee high and spreads. So if you've got rocks, boulders, you want to spill through, or just too much rock in the yard, you just want to soften it up with some ground cover. This is a great, great choice for that. And it'll hold these berries for a ridiculous long time. I mean, like all winter. So tough, I would, I would even call that drought hardy what? Do uh, deer, rabbits? No, animals, animals leave all the Cotoneaster family alone. They do not eat it. So it's a good plant. If you've got lots of rabbits and javelina and stuff, good choice. This is another good choice. Now this I'm excited about. This is a blue puffball, Vitex. What kind of jet? That's unusual. It's got to be military, right? Uh, yeah. This is uh, Vitex. Grows, it's a native drought hardy thing. Animals don't eat it, but normally it gets 12 to 15 foot tall. 
This one we've dwarfed, so it only gets this tall. Same properties, same flower. Blue flowers cover it summer through fall. And then a great gold color. You're seeing, just, just starting to see the leading edge of a fall color, kind of a golden color. But this one, virtually no maintenance. Takes four by four by four, cute little thing, covered in flowers, drought hardy, kind of has everything we want in the landscape here. It's called Blue Puffball Vitex, or Chase, Chase Tree, C-H-A-S-E, it's a common name. And then I just picked yarrow. Take a look at those. These do grow wild. The animals don't eat this, but it's a great perennial. Perennial means it comes back every year just to go around to make things, to beautify things. This, you could probably plant in the yard and treat it like a shrub. Water it a couple times a week and be fine. It would, do, wouldn't need everyday watering like a lot of flowers do. Okay. Even without the flowers, this looks pretty. Okay, should we go down this way now? Yep. Question, are any of your shrubs uh, resistant to wildfires? Wildfires. Wildfires. Well, okay, wildfires, I have a whole class on that alone, so I can't go there very deep. Very, in a nutshell, stay away from evergreens like this. They all are like a matchstick, or at least keep them out away from the house, okay? We generally will plant these in island effects. So we'll plant them with a lot of deciduous things. Things that drop their leaves are fire resistive. They can burn eventually. If you put them underneath, you pour five gallons of gasoline and let them burn for an hour, they might go on, they might light up on fire. But it's generally deciduous things are fire resistant evergreen things like junipers, cypress, cedars, pine, spruce, those you want to be really careful with. And then of course ladders and how to prevent fire from getting in the crown. Let's go this way folks. Right here. So here I went with maybe a little more traditional Midwestern kind of thing, uh, but I, I I like the pine tree. I just like the texture, the green. This is Austrian pine. It's kind of like it. No, oh, this is Bosnian. Oh, it's even a dwarf. This is uh, related to our Ponderosa pine, but it keeps the foliage right to the ground. Whereas a Ponderosa, yes, I do sell those, but basically what you're planting is a trunk. It's just eventually it's going to be foliage up there. I don't see it. It's up there somewhere. Doesn't the wind sound pretty? And then a trunk. This one, for a landscape, I think hold this foliage right to the ground. It's still a long needled pine, okay? So this one is a dwarf of the Austrian pine. Austrians look just the same, but they get like 35 feet tall. This is a Bosnian pine, it gets half that size. So in the mid-teens, it'll tend to height-wise, and maybe 10 feet wide, something like that. Then I brought Magnolia. Deciduous magnolias are super, super hardy. This one, it's about to go into color. You're seeing some color just starting to show up another two weeks, be full on gold. It'll hold that gold for about a week, a month and a half. But in the spring, March, first part of April, before it even puts leaves on, it will have hundreds upon hundreds of saucer shaped flowers on it that are very fragrant beautiful plant here. The deciduous varieties are much hardier than the evergreen varieties. This goes down to like minus 20 or maybe minus 40 degrees. It's some crazy cold we'll never see. But Magnolia, if you want something real tall, uh, 15 feet by 10 feet, maybe that's a bit optimistic. Call it 12 feet by 8 feet, that's a good choice. Stepping down, I've got this evergreen. This is Mahonia or Oregon grape. It's a pretty yellow flower in the spring, typically in March. And then the flowers do form a small grape-like fruit that is edible, although you'll never get any because the birds think they've died and gone to heaven as soon as they see those fruits on there. But if you want an evergreen that's a native, this is a very good choice. Animals don't eat it. Um, anyway, there's two varieties. This variety gets this tall. And there's one that's called compact that gets this tall. And there's even a creeping variety called creeping mahonia. It gets just six inches tall. So they all have the same holly leaf to it, okay? This one, if you're gonna kill it, 
It will be from overwatering, too much care. And I know I'm talking to gardeners, so you all tend to care for things a lot. Be careful. Some of you, your hobby is not gardening. It's watering. <laughs> and so you'll tend to overdo it on this one because it, it will adapt very easily into the landscape. Okay. This one is unusual. I brought it just because I was bringing up some gold colors. Some of these and the contrasting purple is a design idea. The contrasting foliage, contrasting colors. This is fringe flower. It's also a bit unusual in that you don't see it very often. In the spring, it is covered with these beautiful red flowers that are stunning. I mean, just striking, unbelievable red in the spring of the year. And then it has this great color to it throughout the rest of the growing season. And then it'll have this red, it'll turn a bright, bright red, kind of like the color of the flower. It'll turn this bright, bright red in the fall. So it kind of has three seasons kind of covered. Um, it looks innocent. This will get five times larger than this. It'll get up easily to about like this, four by four, five by five. So give it some room. Looks good in a container. I've had it grown right out in the yard. It's pretty versatile. I actually grow a lot of this, especially if real dark colored rock, you know, that mocha chocolate kind of colors that you spread instead of a lawn, you've got rocks, right? And so this guy is called Golden. What's the exact variety? Sea of Gold Juniper. It gets up maybe knee high, no more than three feet, usually about two feet. But it's hardy like, like a juniper, but then it's got this bright yellow color to it. So you can use this in the right place and it really looks striking. It doesn't look that good against crushed granite, those light, real yellow colors. Then you get too much yellow. Makes it look like it needs some iron deficiency. But against a darker color where you get this real hot, hot reflective heat, this is a great plant. Okay, and then up front, just for the perennial, Echinacea, or cone flower. If you're a bird gardener, this is a great plant. So these have been blooming in my yard for months and months. It is a true perennial in that it will actually die back to the ground. You'll forget where it was. It will come back fresh every spring. But you can count on this to bloom summer through fall every year. And it spreads. The seed kind of keeps spreading throughout the yard. If they come up where it's okay, encourage them to grow. If they come up where you don't want them, dig them out by the roots. Okay, let's go down this way. Here I went with kind of a, definitely an old fashioned landscape. Um, I started with the, the tall evergreen. I went with Victory Pyracantha. So this is kind of an old fashioned plant. As kids, you used to pull out the berries and throw them at each other, that kind of stuff. Birds love this one because as the uh, berries ferment, they'll eat them late fall, early winter. Literally, they'll be stumbling around the yard drunk. It just kind of, they love everything about our plant. They love to roost in it. This is a great privacy screen. You want it to get up as high as you want. 12 feet, I've seen it in commercial settings, 12 foot thick to separate parking lots. So you know it's tough. Um, or you can keep it down and just trim it, hedge it down to this size. So it's staked so it can get some height to it, but it's gonna get much bigger, much thicker than this than this currently. Beautiful white flowers in the spring and then it forms these berries. that will hold them through the first part of winter uh, and it is evergreen, okay? So it's tough. I would, con I would consider this even drought hardy. Like once it gets established, can't kill it. Okay. And in front, I put, Again, this is also an abelia. We started out with abelia, but it had a real dark foliage, remember? This is a lighter colored foliage, but abelia has a crazy long bloom cycle. It's a really, from summer all the way through fall and then great fall color. But this one goes well with blue star. I like the blue against the gold. That's, you can never go wrong with blue and gold. It never goes out of style. It always is classic, but there you get this blue star juniper with this golden abelia. This stays very short. This is considered a ground cover, followed by this. And then here, let's see, animals I don't know. I don't think they eat them. They don't eat junipers. They don't eat spirea. 
So this is a this is a Anthony Water Spirea. It's been in bloom for three months. Crazy long bloom cycle. Mine has been in the ground for about five six years. It's up about that tall. I never prune it. I hardly do anything to it. It just looks good in the yard by itself. That's what a spirea does for it. Especially the dwarf or small varieties. So figure knee high, kind of ball shaped. Blooms like this forever. And then it is deciduous, it'll lose its foliage. And so it'll just have this real pretty gold color. And then uh, come back next spring for you. And I'm, oh, I guess I should do this. Daylilies. They're drought hardy, they're tough. Big orange blossoms, actually it depends. There's a lot of different colors you can go with. Trout hardy, adapts to our soil very easily. True, true perennial. It's a great plant for here. I think they're as hardy as iris, only with a prettier flower and a longer bloom cycle. I iris are blooming for three, four weeks and they're done. This blooms for two, three months and they're done. Okay. And then moms. I kind of went moms to kind of match off the berries. Thought, oh, that'd be a good contrast. Orange low, orange high, that'd be a good look. And these are the hardy moms that actually grow, the garden moms. There's two kinds of moms you can plant. Actually, there's only one you can plant. There's two kinds you can buy. So there's florist grade, which are grown in greenhouses. Those are not gonna transfer out. Sometimes people will try to plant them outside and they go, my thumbs just aren't green. It wasn't you, it was the plant you put in if you put garden mums in, these come back every year. You can count on them, and you can almost neglect them, and they still look, they still come back. Mine, I keep them up. I'll keep them, uh, I'll keep the foliage and the flowers up until about January. Eventually, the petals, even when they got that straw color, um, they look, they just have good structure to them. They're pretty, even when they get this straw color as winter eats them up. Eventually the petals will start dropping and getting the hot tub and then I go, okay, that is it. I'm not going to clean that filter that much and I cut them back, uh, usually in January, February sometime, and then I, they just come back fresh every, I mean, you'll cut them back in February, you can already see the green growth already coming up. It's an amazing plant. Okay, let's go this way. So three more. I've got this one, a shade one, and a native. Okay, three, three more. I'll try to cruise through a little faster maybe and get kind of chatty when I get all excited about plants. Anyone know what this is? Midwestern folks, a mite now. This is buckthorn. Buckthorn is a very large, very tough, very fast growing shrub. Takes wind, hail. You can curse at this thing, kick dirt at it, run it over the truck, and it still grows and grows and grows great hardy plant. The reason it's so efficient on the water use is it's got a real thin leaf. So it just doesn't expose itself to all the dry air that we have. This is a giant. It gets up 15 feet, kind of like a chase tree, the big one. So give it some room. Gold in the fall, fire hardy, fire resistant, okay? This is famous right now all around town. Pampas grass. Um, I don't personally have one in my own yard because you have to cut them back every year. This is a humongous grass. Even though this is the dwarf variety, it still gets as tall as I am. The big one gets twice as tall as I am. Uh, to keep them looking good though, you should trim them back about that far off the ground. And I don't want to work that hard. I do have a couple out in the parking lot, mainly because I sell so many of the, these. I want to remind people, oh yeah, you can plant these, I've got them. But personally, from, I plant the small grasses. So coral foresters and deer grasses, mysticanthus, they're easy to maintain. This guy though, pampas grass, they come in three varieties, pink, white, and this ivory feathers, which is a dwarf version of the white. If you're gonna plant one, plant the dwarf. Just be easier for you, and it'll better blooms. This is a um, Spartan juniper. I use this to screen my neighbors across the street because they've got the better view. They're up the hill, above me. I feel like they're looking at me. I feel like the emperor has no clothes on or something. I don't know, I want, I want privacy. So I like to sit out in my front yard, so I put these out to screen up against the street, and they're tough, evergreen plants. You count on them to be about 10, 12 feet tall, by about eight feet wide. 
So it's kind of like a dwarf version of the Arizona Cypress, but it has this real rich, rich green to it, which I like. This is rosemary, two types of rosemary. They've got creeping and they've got upright rosemaries. This one happens to be, I don't know what, this is a chef's choice. How tall does it get? 18 inches. It's kind of a dwarf up like a Tuscan blue. It's a dwarf version. Be great in containers against the driveway. You can't kill rosemary evergreen. Blooms twice a year, March, and again about now, fall. And it is culinary. You can actually use it in the kitchen. I like to take some off and put it on the grill. Not even on the meat, just have it roasting it like a smoke on the grill. Oh, everyone thinks you're a brilliant cook. Even though if they, everything came out charred, it smells good at least. Iris, enough said. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good perennial. You can't kill them, animals don't eat them. It's just they're good. They're good. It just I wish they bloomed a little longer. There are some new varieties coming out with repeat bloomers, but they just don't have not like the, the echinaceas or gallardias. I tend to go towards those because their bloom cycle is so much showier and longer. And I'm a bird gardener. I like the birds, so I like to see I like things that form seed to feed the birds. This is a carpet rose. If you've not grown roses in a while, uh, there's a whole new series of of native, not native, but non-grafted roses. So they're on their own rootstock. So now you don't have to prune them back as easy. Their flowers are not as showy. You're not going to enter them in the fair. But if you want a great looking shrub that starts blooming in March, April, and doesn't stop, I had color on mine through Thanksgiving. That is a, nothing blooms like a rose. But this is a carpet series. It only gets knee high and then spreads like a carpet. The cousin is the knockout series. It's a shrub rose, tr traditional shrub, like a three, four foot shrub with the same flower and no care. It doesn't get bugs, doesn't get mildew. It's a great consistent plant for here. Treat it just like any of the trees in your yard and it will do just fine. If you're going to tend to have this go yellow on you, stop blooming, it'll be from overwatering. Over don't overwater these guys. Okay, so we should go over a shade, shade kind of plant or selection. Shades are already, it's cool and in the shade, they're already starting to show color, so they'll probably lead, lead the fall color by a couple weeks. By the middle of October, another two weeks from now, everything will be showing up color everywhere. So um, the aspens will go, everything will start going. Um, this happens to be Cheyenne Dogwood. I chose this one mainly because, even without the foliage, obviously it's deciduous. Obviously it gets red, it's a tremendous red fall color. But the stems on this are so bright that it looks good even without foliage. So this is great by the front door without leaves. Put twinkle lights on it or just you can have fun with it. Uh, sometimes I'll take cuttings, bring them in as, as a floral vase kind of thing. So it just looks good at the Thanksgiving dinner table, that kind of stuff. So even the stems are pretty. Oh, I see it's already starting to form next spring's flower. It does get a little tiny flower to it. So dogwoods are pretty tough as long as you put them in the shade. It says it'll take full sun. Don't believe it. it in Arizona, at this altitude, it's going to like that east to north facing gardens. Under the canopy of trees, that's where it's going to shine. Right out there in the, in the heat, it's going to hate you. It's going to whine and complain and be a problem. So just put it in the right place. This one is a good evergreen. This is Goshiki Holly. Um, Goshiki in, in Japanese means five colors. So it'll actually, through the seasons, have five different colors. It'll rotate colors through it. So it'll have these creams, greens, uh, whites, reds coming on it as the seasons progress. Very, very good evergreen for your good shade plant. Okay? Gets up. You can easily keep it at that hip high size. It just looks like this. It just looks good. So it's a good contrast. I think it just looks good against the red. Viburnums, although this one got a little bit of hail damage, but viburnums are tough. tough. Out of all of these, this is the toughest one. And it gets up head high, about this big, 
tons of white flowers. I mean, just covered in white flowers in summer. It's a great shade plant. If you need something bigger and really showy, um, look at all the Viburnum series because their flowers are so bright. And then the fall color obviously is starting to show up as gold and it just has good structure to it. Likes to be pruned on, you cut it back to, I don't know, in this size. I wouldn't try to keep it down here, it's too much maintenance. I let it get some size to it, let it get some, some girth to it. Here, this is Azalea. This one actually gets a purple flower to it. Which, what is this, PJM? Purple Jim. Oh, Rhododendron, it fooled me. It's a dwarf roadie. Um, you start seeing the flowers, that's, that's the spring flower on it. So that, that's usually in April, this thing will be covered in purple, just covered in purple. And the great thing about rhododendrons, animals don't eat them. They'll grow underneath that canopy, let's say up in the Timber Ridge, Paisley, the ridge lines where lots of pine trees are there. It's hard to get good flowers to grow because the deer are so thick. These deer, elk, rabbits don't eat rhododendrons. Guaranteed Havilland, don't eat rhododendrons. So nothing's brighter than that in the spring. Then up front, I chose for perennials, hookera, or coral bells. I actually plant these in my tree wells where the emitters are, and they're tough enough to actually take that little bit of water that you're watering trees twice a week, once a week, they'll take that. And then they just have this good copper color. I picked copper just so it would go against some of the foliage that we have here just looks good. They come in chartreuse, purples, reds, all kinds of colors, but I really, really like Pukara. Shall we look at natives? Okay. How are we doing on the live broadcast? You guys still with us? Thanks for watching. Okay, so hardcore natives. Now, here's the mistake people make with natives. Okay, in a nutshell, they plant this native Eliagnus is the wild one. They put it in the ground and they expect it to grow by itself with no care right now. They go on their cruise to the, through the Panama Canal for five weeks, they come back and it's dead. The reason being, you have got to take natives, the roots are right here right now. You've got to get the roots out before it's tough enough to go by itself. In a couple years, it will have enough roots to go all on its own. But until then, you've got to care for it to, get it, to get it established, okay? And that takes two growing seasons, what the what the book technically says, okay? So with that, I usually will put mine on a drip system, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll take the emitter, then bend it back and tape it off. Just in case I wanna water it again, I could. I never do, but I could, because I'm a gardener. I might need to care for this plant later. They're like little puppy dogs in the yard in my, in my world. I like to care for them and nurture them. This is a great evergreen. You don't really notice it out in the yard. It's a big evergreen, gets like this, until the spring. It's the most fragrant flower again you'll ever smell. Silverberry or Eliagnus is a great plant. Evergreen, evergreen, evergreen. Gosh, neglect, abuse, it likes all of that. Just get it established and it'll go all on its own. This one, you probably haven't heard of. It's called Snowberry. I wonder why. <laughs> the berries look like snow. Can you take a look at that? There you go. Snowberry, pretty flowers in summer. Then it forms these berries. It is deciduous, it loses its leaves, but the berries stay on there for an amazingly long time. Very tough, drought hardy plant. Gets head high though, it can get some size. It looks delicate and small. It gets up seriously like like five foot by four foot in size, but pretty. Of course, pinion pines, they grow wild. This happens to be the variety they get the pinion pine nuts off of because it forms nuts, larger nuts, faster than our native one that grows here. And this particular variety I, I like more than our local one because it's got a thicker, fleshier leaf to it and it's bluer. It just has this great textured color to it. And it's less prone to get the scale. There's a pinion pine scale that goes after a lot of our pine trees here. They don't seem to like this one, okay? Down below, we've got yuccas. You had to have at least one yucca 
and one agave mm. in the mix. It's Arizona. We're famous for it for our century plants, agaves, and our yuccas. This happens to be golden sward. I picked it just so that it had that gold color and it contrasts against all the blue in the pinion pine, so it looks great. Okay, get it established and it will go by itself after that. It's this real pretty white flower to it that hovers up about that tall. There's not many cactus that will grow, but prickly pears do really well. There's basically only two. There's prickly pears, there's hedgehogs, little tiny. Oh, and I guess there's choya, jumping cactus, the one that wants to bite you in the rear end, and it does. It actually jumps when it gets dry. Um, I like the prickly pears because they do say southwest. And they get a flower on them. It's kind of, this is, it's hardy enough. It really comes down to cold hardiness. They got to be able to go sub-zero. Because about every 10 years in the mountains of Arizona, we go that cold and it obliterates anything that's even remotely borderline. A lot of mistakes I find my new folks make. They're from the East Coast, from California. And, oh, they love the desert. And I want a saguaro sitting out in my yard. I want these big Phoenix desert uh, uh, cactus. And they look so good until about middle of November. Then they turn to black mush as the cold freezes them back. So be, really do your homework if they'll make it up here. Uh, there's really only three that will make it. The hedgehogs, the prickly pears, and the choyas. Okay. And then agaves. This is called century plant or anyway, just agave. We sell three or four varieties throughout the year. This is the one that grows every day. It grows up to about 12, 15 feet tall. That huge flower, that's this one. The rumor is it blooms once a century. That's not true. It takes about 10, 12 years, maybe 20 if you really let it go by itself. In a, in a decade or two, it will send off that, that big flower to it. By then, it'll be about this big around and start blooming. It's amazing to watch. When, you, when it gets done blooming, harvest the flower and use it as an accent around there. I tie it up against fences. It's just fun to play with them. So, okay. With that, that's my shrub selection. Get some ideas or some thoughts. I'll leave these little groupings together. So you can look at the tags in case you, you want to know more about that one. You can take a look at that. Then I'll hang around for questions. Right now, any questions you've got to ask in the group? These agaves, do they die? after they bloom? They do the die. The end? mother dies after stem blooming, but what will happen is it'll have a bunch of pups underneath. It'll have, she's sent off a bunch of uh, uh, runners underneath the ground. So the way agaves reproduce, the roots will come back by the, by the children, and then it will reseed where it falls, you know, 10, 15 feet away. It'll reseed over there. So that's how it kind of spreads across mm. the landscape. Mm. Yeah. The reason it's so tough you can see it's got a big fleshy root like a like a carrot and then the foliage gathers the water and brings it to the heart so the, the way the foliage is set up it brings all as much water as possible to the core of the plant that's why it's so tough here mm -hmm. okay not all agaves will grow here the one that everyone wants is the blue agave when they make the tequila out of it does not grow up here it's not hardy enough the cold kills it off and i have tried because I love that agave. It's a great big thing. Just just can't get it to, to stay. It gets too cold. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, what about the Apache Flume? Apache Flume's a great one. I didn't bring it up here because I only wanted five plants per collection. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look... I wanted something to look better than that. <laughs> so... I do have a couple Apache plumes in my own yard. Yeah. Um, just because it gets up like this, easy care, and it flowers for such a long time. It's right. the one that you'll see with a white flower, then the flower turns into a plume, Apache plume. Yeah. So it is a great native, native shrub that grows here. But it just didn't go with my, I'm trying to romance and ignite <laughs> creativity, and this did it better than that. That's the only reason. But Apache plumes are good. Okay. Anything else? The yuccas, are they permanent? Do you whack them back? Oh no, oh, good question, very good question. Um, so, let's just take this golden, this uh, soft leaf yucca. This one gets up big, 
okay, it gets up as tall as you and I, clusters, very pretty, white flowers all over it, probably the showiest of, uh, of all the yuccas. Um, the mistake I find is you'll hire your gardener to go clean up your yard, they go back and they think this is a grass, they cut it back, and it takes years to recover from that. Don't do anything to your yuccas, just leave the foliage, you might thin off some of the base. That's the only thing we'll do to them is that at the very bottom, you'll clean off these, these dried ones. That's the only thing you do. That's only on the really big <coughs> yuccas, your Joshua trees, uh, big soft leaf yuccas. The smaller yuccas, you don't do anything to them. Okay, because it may be cut off the flower head. So they'll, sometimes they'll put off this big long flower yeah. and the seed pods will be up there. If you like the seed pods, keep them on. If you don't like the seed pods, cut them off. There you go. At the beginning of each, when I'm pruning up cleaning in the winter, usually in March sometime, I'll cut all the seed heads off and that's all I do with it. I don't cut back the foliage of my yuccas. Mm. Okay. Good, good question. It's one of my pet peeves. I cringe every time I see that. And every spring it's the mm. same. Mm. Thanks you all. I'll let you clap and then I'll release you. Okay.